Hey, good afternoon. In the last lecture, we started talking about this concept of breaking things down between combinational and sequential circuits. So we talked very briefly that, about logical effort, and we knew that in what we've now defined as static CMOS, that this idea that PMOS transistors have to have two lambda versus NMOS transistors have one lambda. So we covered that in a previous section, and we talked about how that ties to output capacitance. We also know that dynamic CMOS is where I'm actually using these output capacitance, this potential stored here, to try to exploit that information to drive the output. So dynamic, as we know, compare it going back, so we have the, our waveform. Static operation occurs when nothing is changing, and dynamic operation occurs when we are changing actual signals from 0 to 1. We talked about bubble pushing, and we did this example problem where we started out with this idea of A and B, right? And then A, B, or C, and D, and we managed to reduce the size of the circuit. Here we have 6, 6, and 6 here. And then we got it down to 4, 4, and 4, and we also know that NAND gates are smaller than NOR gates. So we are able to significantly reduce the size as we figure it out here at the end. This is the circuit that we... Uh, hold on. That wasn't the circuit we designed. We designed this circuit, right? We also used our design principles that we learned back in section two about how we design a PMOS and NMOS pull-up, pull-down circuit with those exact same designs. And we figured out the comparison and the parasitic delay between these two. So we figured out a trade-off between area and delay. We also found out about this concept of asymmetric gates that favor one input as opposed to another input. We figured out how to redesign our two-input NAND gate to change this. We split up the NOR gate so that way they do not favor one input or the other. We also found about this concept of high skew gates and low skew gates. And the way you have to address this is to ensure that the power signal is short enough so that you have one that will re high fast and then the other one kind of goes slow you have to make sure that the clock signal properly operates for both of them however there are pros and cons and we found out here specifically in NOR particularly in low skew we found that the logical effort these low skew gates particularly the NOR gate compared to our regular unskewed gate is improved so so they're trying to take advantage of that in these logic families. So here we de designed some ratioed logic. We discussed resistive loads. Now the way we calculated this is we have our pull-down network. So these are in parallel, right? So our PDN, the way this actually worked is this is 1 over our total equals... 1 over R pull-down network plus 1 over RL, right? And we figured this out since they're in parallel, how that actually works, and that equation comes out to this. And then we have also proven this 0 0.69 number, and that is static power consumption, and that is our time delay. So we have some sort of change, and then it changes, and it takes... 0 0.69, and this notation is identical to that, times the capacitive load. We also learned about depletion load, where the output is tied to ground uh, to the gate with a PMOS. And then we learned about pseudo-NMOS. Pseudo-NMOS is where we have a ground tied to the PMOS, but we only have one PMOS gate. And everything else is tied into uh, NMOS transistors. So based on this chart, we found out that as we're reducing the ratio here of width and length, we have a improved delay. However, here we have the other one where the delay goes a lot slower. However, it's adversely proportional to power consumption. And if we have a low delay, 
However, we're able to get to a significantly lower 0, 1 voltage that is actually beneficial for these logic families. So we did this last problem where we actually derived the ratio for a pseudo NMOS inverter. And we set this equal because our PMOS is in saturation and our NMOS we want to be in linear. So then we set those equal to each other and then we derived the final equation. We got, used the numbers and we came up with a ratio of approximately four. So then what we were able to do here, since we know that our PMOS is multiplied by two, we were able to get two, and then we were able to use that to get four. And then given, we divide by a third of the current as we found out through experiment, and we also use I equals C D V D T. We were able to divide both of these by one third. So that's how we were able to get that solution. And then last, certainly not least, we compared the pseudo NMOS logical effort for up, logical effort for down. Remember, these are ratioed, so we have to know the average for each of these. So average for inverter is 8 ninths, the average for the NAND gate is 16 ninths, and the average for the NOR gate is also 8 ninths. So using these numbers here, we're actually going to start with example question 5.4. And we are going to try to determine the actual parasitic delay of a specific gate. So in example 5.4, we are to design a K input AND gate with De Morgan's law. So if you have C De Morgan's law, initially you think bubble pushing. Using static CMOS inverters, followed by a K input pseudo NMOS NOR. So now we are combining logic families to try to have some sort of optimization of power and area. Let each inverter be unit sized. If the output load is an inverter of size H, determine the best transistor sizes in the NOR gate and estimate the average delay of the path. Assume the parasitic delay of a K input pseudo N MOS to be A K plus four over nine. So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about these inverters. So we know our path logical effort is H because here our branching effort is 1 because we are not branching and the inverter has a logical effort of 1 so the N input NOR as we got from here is 8 ninths so this number correlates to these, this number and that number so therefore, G equals 1 times 1 times H, which is 8 ninths, 8H over 9. Therefore, the best stage effort is going to be 8H over 9 to the square root because we have two stages. One stage is the inverter, and the next stage is the pseudo and mas nor. So there, next thing we want to do is we want to calculate the actual input capacitance of the unit inverter. The reason why we want to do that is because then we're going to take that information and calculate the average delay of the path. So now we have our output and input. We have our input, which we've calculated here. We've calculated our best stage effort, which we calculated here. And G is equal to 1. So then that becomes square root of 8H over 3. And therefore, we are able to calculate our average delay of the path. And we do this using our equation, delay is equal to the number of stages times the best stage effort plus the parasitic delay. We calculated this here, and then 2 comes from the number of stages. Next thing, we are given 8k plus 4 over 9 as our stage effort for the NMOS pseudo NMOS, and then we are given a unit size inverter of 1 here, and this solves out to that. And the third plus 13, 1 over 1 is the same as 9 over 9, so then this becomes 8K plus 4 over 9 plus 9, this is just now 13. So that's how we solve this particular problem here.
Next, we're going to calculate static power dissipation of a 32-word by 48-bit ROM. So we have some sort of memory. So we have 32 words. 32 words that should sound familiar. It sounds kind of like the registers in MIPS. Because remember, we have 32. And then we have a 48-bit ROM. It contains a 5 by 32 pseudo NMOS row decoder. So if you recall, for MIPS, we have our 5-bit input for our RS, RT, and RD. Right? 5 and 5 and 5. Right? And then we have to have a 5 to 32-bit decoder to select the specific word that we want. So now we're actually calculating the power consumption of that device. So the PMOS transistor has an on current of 360 microamps per micrometer. So now we're using the same concept that we used before in calculating wire resistance. We have to know the length, which is the width. Here it is, 100 nanometers. And so first thing we know is we're calculating out our width, our current, using the width, and therefore we're able to calculate the current, and then we know the supply voltage is one volt. So therefore we're able to calculate the static power dissipation. Next, we assume one of the word lines and 50% of the bit lines are high at any given time. So therefore we can actually break this down a step further. So for the pull up, First thing we do is we do I static and V static. We know that the current in any wire is 360 microamperes over micrometers. We multiply that by 100 nanometers, and I've given you the conversion factor here in the problem. Multiply that out, we get 36 microwatts. Next, we assume one of the word lines, and 50% of the bit lines are high. So here, we have 50 times 50% 50 times 48 plus 31, which is 32. One minus, you know, 32 is 31 here, times 36 microwatts, and therefore we get 1.98 milliwatts. So the next thing we're going to do here is we're going to take this concept where we have this tied to ground for our pseudo NMOS, and we have an NMOS pull-down network. And what happens if we use this as an enable signal? So if we have an enable not, that means when it's zero, it's going to enable the PMOS transistor. But when it's one, the PMOS transistor is going to be off, and so we're cutting off VDD entirely. So we can use this pull-up signal to pre-charge and evaluate the logic structure. And that's where exactly what we're going to do. So TGO 5.12 states, dynamic logic is a CMOS circuit family that uses clocked PMOS as a pull-up signal to pre-charge and evaluate the logic structure. So here, we actually have another sizing where the PMOS and NMOS ratios are identical. And what's going to happen here is we're going to have this concept of pre-charge. So right now, phi is zero. So phi is going here. So we have our circuit. So what's going to happen is phi is going to go to one. This means our transistor is going to go away. So one's going to drop to, y is going to drop to zero because automatically that's going to come to the output because we're cutting it off and then goes down, and then Y is going to go back up. So if we had A here, we had this idea, so, and that ties into this question, what if the pull-down network is on during pre-charge? So we have this instance where A is equal to zero, and it will work just like this. But if I start making A equals one, that means the NMOS transistor is going to be on, and we're going to be fighting during the evaluation stage. I'm sorry, during pre-charge stage, because we're going to have 0 and 1, 
and that's going to be fighting the natural concept of the inverter. So what's going to happen is, if we recall, we have this idea of the stack effect where we have PMOS, we have an NMOS circuit, and we have another NMOS circuit in series. So if A is going to be on, and then what we're going to do is we're going to do phi here and here. That means if we have pre-charge zero, and the PMOS transistor is on, that means no matter what the value of A is, zero is going to go to this NMOS transistor, which means it's going to be off. So therefore, we've eliminated this instance where the pull-down network is on during pre-charge. So we're going to define this specific type of transistor as a foot transistor. And this is TGO 5.13. A foot transistor is an NMOS evaluation circuit in series with the pull-down network and dynamic logic used to prevent degraded output signals during the evaluation phase. And so we want to... Uh, Next, we want to compare the logical effort of footed and unfooted dynamic logic. So, here, we have an unfooted based on these comparisons that we've done. Oh, by the way, the TGO ends uh, there. Um, our logical effort and delay is one-thirds and two-thirds. Here, we've gained logical effort and delay, but we have now guaranteed ourselves an instance where we don't have to worry about evaluation degradation, same thing with NAND gates, and same thing with NOR gates. You see we have this gain in logical effort and delay, but we have, we've eliminated this instance previously where we have to worry about uh, fighting each other. We've used the stack effect to help improve this, the circuit. Now we're going to start running into a little problem here. Because of the fact that we're using this pre-charge and foot delay for phi, we're going to have an instance where pre-charge and it's on, and then we're going to have some sort of thing, some sort of A signal, right? So it can be high when this is zero, right? When it's zero, it's going to be off. So what happens when A becomes one when phi is zero? When phi is zero, we're going to want the output to be run. But when phi is 1, this means we're going to have 1 and it's going to be 0. So this transistor is going to be on. But if this is 0, what's going to happen? That means all three transistors are going to be off. I'm sorry, all three transistors are going to be on. What happens if this is 1, though? That's what I meant. So what happens when we have an instance where we are evaluating and A is 1? So this becomes zero, so this transistor, we have this one off, right? This one is on. So then we have, oh, so this one is off. So this one is on. Now does, we don't have a path to either output. So what this means is that this function is monotonic. And we're going to define it formally is if its input, output is greater than or equal to its input. For digital logic, this means the circuit may go from 0 to 0, 0 to 1, and from 1 to 1, but not from 1 to 0. So this becomes a problem, especially if we're trying to use this dynamic logic as an inverter. And here is a chart that explains basically what I was just describing. So we have pre-charge and evaluation stage. So we have some sort of output based on input. So A switches during the evaluation stage from 1 to 0 for our inverter. So phi is going to be 1 here, which means our 0 is going to be going to our NMOS transistor, right? So we have a 0 going to the foot, and we also have a 0 on the other PMOS transistor. So we have a 0 on this one, a 0 on this one, and a 1 on our PMOS. We know that these turn on when PMOS is 0 and NMOS is 1, so none of these transistors are working. So it's just going to drive to ground. So we are hoping we have an A on a 1, A and a 0 on the input, which what it means is that this should go to 1 because we want it to be an inverter. However, it does not. 
So how do we address this? Well, we address this by this concept of domino logic. Domino logic, we define here, is a logic family which solves the monoticity problem by placing a static CMOS inverter between dynamic gates. And so this is where the TGO ends. But this is how it's described. Each domino gate triggers the next one. So here we have a dynamic gate, a NAND gate here, and a static CMOS inverter. So they start acting like a domino. We have another NAND gate, we have another inverter. And so by doing this, we're able to trigger the next one, and the gates evaluate sequentially, but pre-charge in parallel. Because we see we have our fee here, and we have our fee here. So the pre-charge in parallel, however, they're going to evaluate. So let me get rid of this. So they evaluate in parallel. So this means fees goes here, and fee goes here, and if we had another domino here, it would evaluate there, right? So that means, that means they're pre-charging in parallel. However, they're evaluating sequentially. And what that means is it starts here. We have our inputs. We go to our output. Evaluates here. Goes here. Operates. Then goes here. Therefore, the evaluation stage is more critical than pre-charge, which means we have to know what's going to happen when V is going to be equal to 1. Our evaluation stage means we're actually evaluating what's going on in the NMOS pull-down networks. So therefore, it becomes more important. And therefore, high-skewed stage, static stages can perform logic. So therefore, we can achieve everything. So this logic, we have a NAND gate with an inverter. And so this is what the circuit actually looks like. NAND gate, inverter, NAND gate, inverter. And so this logically comes out to two AND gates with phi. Now, if we recall, if we were just going to do static CMOS, we're going to do a NAND gate, which is four transistors, plus two, plus four, plus two. But we the size comes from PMOS. PMOS in static CMOS causes a lot of size. Here, we've reduced the size with a trade-off in delay and power consumption, and we're able to make a smaller circuit. So now, we're going to combine all these concepts into example 5.6. We design, we're going to, our goal is to design a fast six-input OR gate with each of the following circuit families. We're going to, so that when I mean that, I mean A, B, and C. So that ties here in that first sentence. Sketch an implementation using two stages of logic. Example, NOR gate 6 and inverter, NOR 3 and NAND, etc. Label each gate with the width of the NMOS and PMOS transistors. Each input can drive no more than 30 lambda of transistor width. So that's going to be important for our output. The output must drive a 60-30 inverter, i.e. an inverter with 60 lambda wide PMOS and 30 lambda wide NMOS transistor. And those kinds of things are going to be using for, uh, we're going to be able to restore signals. So this is a very large buffer. Use logical effort to choose the topology and size for, for the least average delay. Estimate this delay losing logical effort. When estimating parasitic delays, count only the diffusion capacitance on the output node. Assume the parasitic delay of a k-input pseudo-NMOS NOR gate to be 8k plus 4 over 9. Assume the parasitic delay of a k-input domino NMOS NOR gate to be 2k plus 1 over 3, and the parasitic delay of a high-skew inverter to be 5 sixth. So we are going to be doing static CMOS, pseudo-NMOS, and domino logic. And yes, I did just move that around because I know that bothers you guys sometimes. I'm messing with you. Anyway, so for static CMOS, we have our, in this case, I've chosen a three input NOR gate and a two input NOR gate with, with uh, negation. So this is going to be our N equals two. We also define the branching effort to be one and H to be this value because we are given a 60 over 30 lambda, right? And it also drives a 30 lambda output. So 60 plus 30 over 30 becomes 90 over 30, which becomes 3. So for all values of H, 
we're going to have three. So here to reduce the size a little bit, we've bubble pushed and we've turned this into a NOR gate. Now ignore this P equals 20 and N equals 20 for the time being. I'll explain where those numbers come from. Now remember, our logical effort for a static NMOS transistor is 2N plus 1 over 3. We multiply that by N plus 2 over 3 because that's our NOR gate. And we get, when we plug in our numbers, we have three inputs on the NOR gate and two inputs on the NAND gate. So that number comes out to 28 over 9. For our effort, we're going to multiply G, H, and B. That becomes 28 over 9 times 3, which we calculated up here, times 1, which is our branching effort. So that becomes 28 thirds. And then F, our best, best effort, is going to be square root of 28 over 3. Wow, that came out wonderful. That's just 28 over 3 here, which is approximately 3.05. Now, C in, we're going to have G out, G times C out times our best effort. So 60 plus 30, which we have up here, is going to be our C out. We have calculated our output effort as four-thirds because of the NMOS trans. I'm sorry, of the, uh, um, let me draw that again. We've calculated four-thirds because of this guy. And therefore, we've also calculated 3.05 here. So we calculated that out, and that comes out to 39. Now, this is where these numbers 20 and 20 come from. So we're going to have, if you recall, from our NAND gate, we have 2 lambda in parallel with 2 lambda for PMOS and PMOS, and then we have 2 lambda for NMOS and 2 lambda for NMOS for our static NOR gate. So therefore, we can say that 39 lambda, which we calculated here, is equal to 4 lambda, because we have 2 lambda and 2 lambda. So therefore, I'm sorry, 39. So therefore, lambda is equal to uh, approximately 10. So therefore, we each 2 lambda for PMOS and 2 lambda for NMOS that becomes 20 and 20 approximately, which is where those numbers came from. So this is the design of our static CMOS. So this is part A. So for part B, I want you to draw the design. So for pseudo NMOS, the way you draw the design out is you initially draw the not value and then draw an inverter. So here we have our PMOS so tied to ground, and therefore it's a six input NOR gate, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six NMOS transistors, and then we're gonna invert it, and we're gonna, I'm gonna tell you how we got these numbers in a moment. Now recall earlier the problem, our logical effort on average is 8 ninths. That was given in the uh, table. And therefore, so for pseudo NMOS for a NOR gate. Now, same thing, we know that 3 is going to be our H value, which we calculated earlier in the problem. 1 is going to be our path effort. So that's our, I'm sorry, our branching effort. So that's G. So this becomes 8 thirds. Then we find our best effort square root of 8 thirds, which becomes 1.63. Calculating the input capacitance, we use 90, which we got from our 60 lambda plus 30 lambda. We use 1, because that's driving an inverter. And then 1.63, which is here. That comes out to 55.1. So recall two lambda for PMOS, one lambda for NMOS for an inverter. So we 55.1, three lambda 
Lambda is approximately 18.4. You could use 19 to do this. Uh, you can use it. I'm sorry. You could do 18 to do this exactly. So you could do 36 and 18 to size your transistor on the output. And then finally, to calculate the delay, the delay is going to be number of stages times the best effort, which is 2 times 1.63 times 8K plus 4 over 9, which is given in the problem as the parasitic delay of the pseudo NMOS. And we add 1 because it's the parasitic delay of the inverter. Now this solves out to approximately 10. Last but certainly not least, domino logic. We're going to tie these values here. We have our inverter. Remember our domino inverter, 5 sixths, and we're going to have 2 thirds here. So this becomes 2 thirds times 5 sixths, which becomes 10 over 18. H is 3 again, B is 1 again. So this becomes 10 eighteenths times 3 times 1, which is 10 sixths. Best path effort is the square root of 10 over 6, which is 1.29. Calculating C out, you know, 90 times 5 sixth. 5 sixth is, comes from our inverter. We're 1.29, which we calculated here. And that comes out to 58. So we want to do the same thing. We go all the way back to our domino logic. Recall 58 is 1 lambda over 1 lambda, right? For our domino inverter, our domino inverter is going to be 58 divided by 2, which comes out to 229. So we have 29 and 29 to meet that constraint. Finally, to calculate the delay, we multiply the best effort times the number of stages, which is 2, times 2k plus 1 over 3, which is given in the problem, plus 5 sixth, because that's our inverter. This comes out to 7.75. All right, so that concludes combinational logic. So next thing we're going to do is deal with sequential circuits. In dealing with sequential circuits, they are going to be designed with flip-flops or latches, which we've covered previously in 385, right? But we're going to be talking about a little further about these concepts of memory elements. So when we pass values along a sequential circuit, we are going to be dealing with this concept of a token. Now, the token is defined in 5.16 here as the value of the current state. So if we have some sort of uh, finite state machine, right? And so the current state of each one of these is called a token. So if tokens move through the pipelines at constant speed, no sequential elements would be necessary. However, that's not necessarily the case. Now, a very good example of this is fiber optic cable. Now, let's say you're on a submarine and you are trying to use a fiber optic cable to help monitor the nuclear reactor. Now, you have to make sure the timing is proper because you need to be able to measure pressure, temperature, uh, the speed at which the water is flowing through the primary and secondary loops, etc. Therefore, maintaining the accuracy of a fiber optic cable is actually very important in the safety of those designs. So therefore, this is where you as a computer engineer, you as an electrical engineer, come into play. These light pulses are sent down the cable, so the next pulse is sent before the first one is reached, reaches the end of the cable. So there's no need for the hardware to separate the pulses because they're going to come in at certain times. And this is known as wave pipelining. And you're going to be taking the light pulse, the specific value of the light pulse, which has our, not only the value, but also the decoding signal. So the decoder is going to take the value, and then let's just, just say it's a 1 to 4 decoder. 
So you have the four outputs that you need in order to be able to run whatever circuit you're running. This concept is known as wave pipelining. So we have, however, in pipeline circuits, right? So we learned about stages. We have one, two, three, four, five for MIPS. So we have right back, goes back to the registers and all this jazz. We have to delay the fast tokens. We have to make sure that all of these timing constraints are met. We don't want to create cache inconsistency. So we have to make sure that the, del del uh, the tokens are delayed. So therefore, all of these circuits reach at the exact same time. So now we have a D-latch and D-flip-flop here. So we have our clock signal. And D is going to change during when size 1, and it's going to change when low is 1 here, when the clock is low here. So the, for the latch, what's going to happen is it's going to change both times, right? And then it'll change again when it reaches here after the delay, right? So once it reaches here, this is where the change occurs. For the flip-flop, it's going to change here, and it's going to change again after the evaluation stage. So the clock is driving it, but in this case, both times, D is driving the output. So next, we're going to compare a number of, of these circuits that actually help regulate this, this pipelining in the circuit. So the first one is called a CMOS latch. CMOS latch is just an NMOS transistor with a fee evaluation. So it's tiny and has low clock load. However, we have to worry a lot about the threshold voltage. And also, what happens when it's zero? Does not allow for restoring. Output noise sensitivity. How much is it actually, what type of circuit is it driving? We have to worry about output capacitance. We also have to worry about it being dynamic. And we have to worry about what happens when we have some sort of issue with diffusion on the input. So all the TGO is the drawing and description. So for all of these that are coming up, uh, I want the drawing and the pros and cons. For 5.18, we're gonna. This is a CMOS transition gate. So you're gonna have an inverter having phi and phi bar, and then you D, Q on the output, and requires an inverted clock, so that's a con. However, you don't have to worry about the threshold voltage drop because you're worried, because you have both a PMOS and an NMOS transistor to account for it. And because you have to have a PMOS transistor, it requires a larger area. For an inverting buffer, we're going to take this CMOS latch and either put an inverter on the input or an inverter on the output to address some of these diffusion issues. So the input diffusion is effect is approved if we put the I'm sorry if we put the uh, inverter here, and the noise sensitivity on the output is approved if we put the inverter here. So we have those taken care of, and no back driving. What this means is if we have a PMOS and NMOS transistor here, what happens if you go this way? What happens if you go that way? you can potentially get this concept called backdriving. Now, there are certain logic families that actually take advantage of that backdriving, but we're not really going to go into that much in the course. And this allows for restoring logic. However, the con is the, the output is inverted as opposed to what you initially wanted. So... We prove this a little further by trying to get with this tri-state feedback. So we have our we have our complementary uh, pass transistor. We have an inverter driving the output, which allows for static. However, the inverter kind of comes back here, which we have this issue of back driving again. So now we have brought back this problem. So 5.20 of these two cons and the tri-state feedback. So now, let's deal with this concept of buffered input. So buffered input, we have a inverter. We've eliminated this inverter. And now we have our non-inverting, and we've fixed the diffusion. 
And finally, we have this concept of buffered output. So the buffered output is we have the input, we have our loop, but it's not tied to the output here. It's tied to the output here. So this allows us to eliminate back driving because the loop's here, but the output signal is going this way. This is wide, our widely used circuit for, it's very robust, however, it's significantly large. Remember, we started out here with just our NMOS transistor, so then we had our PMOS transistor, then we had moved an inverter, so we had to address back driving, so we put this loop in here, that was our output, but it had back driving. So then we add our, our buffered output, so it's eliminated, the inverted signal, we've eliminated back driving, we fixed our diffusion input, it's not inverting, however, it is rather slow and has high clock loading. So now, we're going to try to use all of these uh, concepts to address this idea where we want to design some flip-flops. Flip-flops are built as back-to-back -back latches. So here we had latch, inverter, latch, inverter. And now we're going to do flip-flop. So we have, we call from here, we have our buffered output. So we put two of these together, and now we have ourselves a flip-flop. So now it'll change every other evaluation stage. We tie phi to our clock, and therefore you now have a flip-flop. So the issue becomes when you're tying all these things circuits together, how do you ensure that the tokens are propagated to the output properly in the correct amount of time? So TGO 5.23 is going to just briefly talk about these three. We find the first one is a flip-flop based system, which we just described, it uses one flip-flop on each cycle boundary. Tokens advance from one cycle to the next on the rising edge. If a token arrives too early, it waits at the flip-flop until the next cycle. So if you recall, we're going from zero to one on the rising edge. So what's happening on the rising edge of our flip-flop? Well, our first thing we deal with is an inverter, right? So we've gone from zero to one. So we have one and zero, which means our PMOS transistor is off. Our NMOS transistor, sorry, we, I'm sorry, we've gone from zero to one, so one is here. So therefore, our NMOS transistor is on. So now our NMOS transistor is consuming energy and the PMOS transistor is off. So therefore, when we do this on the rising cycle, rising edge, I mean, we are consuming less power. Next, we're going to talk about this concept of two-phase transparent latches, which divide the full cycle of combinational logic into two phases. So we have a combinational logic thing, device, and then we break it up into two phases, kind of like pipelining. At any given time, at least one clock is low and the corresponding latch is opaque, preventing one token from catching up with another. And I'll just be going through some uh, clock signals to describe why that is and how that works. And the third is a pulled latch system, which eliminates one of the latches from this, each cycle and applies a brief pulse to the remaining latch. If the pulse is shorter than the delay through the combinational logic, we can still expect that a token will only advance through one clock cycle on each pulse. So, we're going to start talking about, we're going to compare each of these. So we have a clock signal, right? So it's going to go high here, go down, all right? And that's our TC, so that's our clock time. So our flip-flops, we have some flip-flop. Then it goes through combinational logic, which is doing what we want it to do. And then we have a flip-flop on the output. So that meets our definition because we have a flip-flop monitoring each clock pulse. So we've timed this so that with the combinational logic has some sort of so we have our output, it's done here, and then we're doing time in the combinational logic. And then we want it to reach here so that way the flip-flop properly operates after our delay, 
within there to properly change the output. This ensures that the token is propagated in the proper amount of time. Next, we're going to talk about our transparent latches. So we need our two fee inputs because it's a two-phase transparent latch. So we have a clock, we have fee one, fee two, and then fee one is in the next stage. So fee one goes from zero to one and then back to zero, right? So here, this is going to be important. This is concept of non-overlapping time. This is a defined in the two-phase latch as the instance when the fee one is zero and clock is high. In the second fee, this is the instance when the fee is high and the clock is low. So we've split them up. So this instance has gone back low, meaning we're not operating, and they match. So we have two non-overlapping times. So we start working on our example problems here in a moment. This is going to become important in two-phase transparent latches. Finally, we have a pulse latch. We have a pulse, which operates our initial latch. And then we have some sort of combinational logic that we're doing. And then the, we time this such that the combinational logic ends at the end of the cycle time. So therefore, our fee pulses the latch. The latch is a short amount of time. And therefore, we have our next combinational circuit. We, this requires significant amount of uh, timing accuracy. So when we start talking about these example questions, we're going to be going into these steps of delay. So we have our propagational delay, contamination delay again. So then each of these three times, we're going to have to worry about latch and flip-flop clock propagation delay. So this is TPCQ and TCCQ, contamination delay, propagation delay, clock. TPDQ is latch, propagation delay, contamination delay, Q. For, and then setup and hold time, which is our latch and flip-flop hold times. So the TGO is this chart. So this example question, we're going to describe and differentiate example 5.7 between the propagation delays for a combinational logic circuit, a latch, and a flip-flop. We're going to draw the tying diagram corresponding to each circuit. So here we have some sort of combinational logic. So we have an input A and an output Y. So here we have our change, and this becomes the delay between the contamination delays our minimum amount of time. And the propagation delay is our maximum amount of time. The output Y cannot change instantaneously after the contamination delay, TCD. Y may begin to change or glitch. So we have this glitch time between our contamination uh, initial contamination delay and our propagation delay. And that's why it's called contamination delay, because we have this glitch time. After the propagation delay, TPD, Y must have settled to a final value. The contamination delay and propagation delay may be very different because of multiple paths to the combinational logic. So here's part two of the problem. So here we have a latch, so we have a clock. So we have some sort of D input that we don't know. And then what's gonna happen is we have our TCCQ here and then our propagation delay for our Q bar, right? So we have some, it's flipping here. And therefore, we're changing Q. Now see, we change D here. So now we have our change between D initially here and D, P, D, Q. And therefore, we have, from the last change, we have setup time and hold time. Now, the input D must set up and hold around the falling edge that defines the edge of the sampling period. The output initially changes after TCCQ after the latch becomes transparent on the rising edge of the clock. 
and settles by TPCQ. While the latch is transparent, the output will continue to track the input after some D to, P, D to Q delay, T, C, D, Q, and T, P, D, Q. And finally, this is the last part of the problem. This is for the flip-flop. The data input must be stable for some time for some window around the rising edge of the flop. So here, we have clock, and we have change. So we have some sort of stable amount of time. If it's to be reliably sampled. Specifically, the input D must have settled by some setup time, T setup, before the rising time. So here's T setup. So it has to settle to the value we want before the clock occurs. Now this is important, why timing is important, because if you don't do that, you're going to have some sort of, uh, excuse me, some sort of uh, result where you're constantly changing values or it's not going to work. It should not engage until a hold time T hold after the clock rises. So if some sort of change that occurs in Q and then after the evaluation, we have our Q output that we want. The output begins to change after a clock to Q contamination delay TCCQ, which is here, clock to contamination delay, and completely settles after a clock to propagation delay TPCQ. So the point is from here to here, so our setup and hold and our delay, we need the value of D to be correct. And then we have some sort of change. Then once it reaches here, the values that we want are going to be on the output, and it's irrelevant what D is at that point. So this is the end of the problem 5.7. Five point seven ends here. So next we're going to start talking about delay constraints. Ideally, the entire clock cycle would be available for computation for combinational logic. However, sequential overhead makes this kind of impossible. So we're going to start talking about this idea of setup time failure. If it's and ultimately want to settle, um, excuse me, <clears throat> ultimately want to ensure that we are observing the correct values in the device. So the setup time failure is an instance where the combinational logic delay is too great, resulting in the sequential element receiving an incorrect token. So TGO ends here, and this is an example. So we have our clock signal, right? And then we have some sort of propagation delay here. And then our setup time is here. The propagation delay with the rising edge of the clock, F1, the data must propagate to the output of the flip-flop, Q1. We're trying to sample it before we get to this unknown value. The data must propagate to the output of flip-flop, Q1, or through the combinational logic to D2, setting up at F2 before the next rising clock. This implies that the clock must have at least contamination delay is greater than, I'm sorry, the clock cycle time must be greater than or equal to TPCQ times TP setup. So these three values in a latch. I'm sorry, in a flip-flop. So therefore, TGO 5.26, and this will become important in the problems, the clock period for a flip-flop must be, at most, TC is greater than or equal to TPCQ plus TPD plus T setup, and the maximum allowable logic delay for a flip-flop is TPD is less than or equal to TC minus the quantity TPCQ plus T setup, so that's just solved here. It's TPD is less than or equal to TC minus TPCQ minus, uh, plus T setup. So this delay has to be less than or equal to this time here. So this delay is what we're calculating. has to be less than or equal to that quantity. And we define this TPCQ in the setup as our sequencing overhead.
So this is gonna be a really good combining concepts type question. The arithmetic logic unit self-bypass path limits clock frequency of some pipeline microprocessors. The integer execution unit, IEU of the Itanium 2, contains self-bypass paths for six separate ALUs as shown in the figure below. So this is the figure below. Here we have our early bypass MUX, a middle bypass MUX, we have result MUX, we have some sort of wire resistance and capacitance, and our late bypass MUX, which then goes back to our initial flip-flop. So to go back up to the problem, the path for one of the ALUs begins at registers containing the inputs to an adder. The adder must compute the sum or difference for subtraction. The result multiplexer chooses between this sum, the output of the logic unit, and the output of the shifter, which we can see here. So we have some sort of three, uh, we have some eight bit inputs and we some sort of, we have to select between these three. Then a series of bypass multiplexers selects the inputs to the ALU for the next cycle. The early bypass multiplexer chooses among the results of the ALU from the previous cycles is not on the critical path. The eight to one middle bypass multiplexer, which is this guy, chooses a result from any six of the ALUs. The early bypass MUX or the register file. So we have this one here, or the register file. The four to one late bypass MUX, which is this guy here, chooses a result from either of the two results returning from the data cache, the middle bypass MUX result, or the immediate operand specified by the next instruction. The critical path also involves two millimeter wires from the result MUX to the middle bypass MUX and from the middle bypass MUX back to the late bypass MUX. Suppose the registers are built from flip-flops with a setup time of 62 picoseconds a hold time of negative 10 picoseconds, propagation delay of 90 picoseconds, and a contamination delay of 75 picoseconds. Calculate the minimum cycle time TC at which the ALU self-bypass path will operate correctly. So here we're combining flip-flops, combinational elements, wire delays, propagation delays. This is a very good combining concepts type problem. And here we are given the path we are given the propagation delay of each of these elements and the result. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to find the critical path of the combinational port of the circuit. So our critical path, as we've outlined in red here, which I can outline again, goes through the adder, the result MUX, the first wire, the middle bypass MUX, the second wire, and the late bypass MUX. So therefore, we have 590 picoseconds. The result much, which is 60 picoseconds. The late by middle bypass MUX, 80 picoseconds. The late bypass MUX was 100 picoseconds. And two, two meter wires, which becomes 100 times two. And this adds up to 100 picoseconds. We are given in the problem here, given 90 nanoseconds, um, picoseconds, and 100, I'm, I'm sorry, 62 picoseconds. Recall the propagation delay TPD is 90 picoseconds, and the setup time is 62 picoseconds. So we go back to our equation from the topical guide objective, our delay, setup time, and PCQ. We have calculated this as 1,000. Our setup time is 62 picoseconds, which is given in the problem. 90 seconds for our contamination delay is also given in the problem. This comes out to 1,152 picoseconds. Next, we're going to consider the maximum propagation delay for a two-phase latch. So, oh, I'm sorry, well, this is the end of the problem. Sorry, this is the end of the problem. That was a long setup. And the reason why is because uh, when we're going to be going down to our next problems here. We're gonna be referencing these again. So 5.9 references it, 5.10 does as well. So now we're gonna talk about two-phase latch. 
So we're going to derive the equation just like we did in the previous topic. We got objective for a delay latch. So we have our clock cycle. We have our propagation delays for T and Q. We have our top relation delays of our two combinational logic elements. And so therefore, the clock cycle adds up to that. TBDQ1 delay to one for a combinational element. So this goes to this one, that one, uh, that one, and that one. And so you can see TBD1 is from here to here. TBDQ here is from here to here. The delay of the combinational element is there. The delay of the combinational element is there. So therefore, 5.27, we derive the actual uh, delay. So we're going to assume here that our delay for TPD1 and TPD2 are identical. So the clock phase period of a two-phase latch must be at most TC is greater than or equal to TBQ1 plus TDB. So we just use this equation here. And the maximum allowed logic delay for a flip-flop is delay is equal to TBD1 plus TBD2 greater than, is less than or equal to TC minus 2 TBDQ. So we're assuming those are identical for using the same kind of latch. So this sequencing overhead we define here as our latch and our latch. So we're making sure that our sequencing is met properly with these two latches, which is why it's called sequencing overhead. So now we're going to do the same thing with a pulse latch. The max delay constraint for pulse latch is similar to the pulse latch, except that only one latch is in the critical path when the pulse width is greater than or equal to the setup time. However, the pulse is narrower than the setup time. The data must set up before the pulse rises. And here's what I mean by that. So we have our diagram of these two instances. Here where the pulse width is greater than the setup time, so we have some sort of setup time here, right? We're going to have our TPDQ delay, our TPD delay here, and that's where our clock cycle comes in. However, if the pulse width is less than the setup time, we're going to have some sort of small pulse. We're going to have a setup here, and we have our TPDQ here, and then our TPD here, and this is how it's going to set up. So this is going to become a max problem. So with this notation here and the we're going to have two values we're going to calculate. So here it's going to be TBDQ plus TPD, right? Or, and that's a comma, TPCQ plus TPD plus T setup minus the pulse width. So these two values, we're going to compare these and then use that to calculate the actual value. So whichever one is greater. So TGO 5.28 states, the clock period for a pulse latch must be at most T max of the propagation delay of T to Q plus the propagation delay, or the TPCQ plus TBD plus T setup minus the pulse width. Solving for propagation delay, we get this equation, and therefore this value is our sequencing overhead. Going back to our problem from before, we recompute the ALU self-bypass cycle time from example 5.8 if the flip-flop is replaced with a pulse latch. The pulse latch has a pulse width of 150 picoseconds, a setup time of 40 picoseconds, a hold time of 5 picoseconds, a clock to Q propagation delay of 82 picoseconds, and contamination delay of 52 picoseconds, and a deep to Q propagation delay of 92 picoseconds. So we still have our propagation delay is 100 picoseconds, like we calculated in the previous problem. Therefore, let's solve this out. So our propagation delay, 92 picoseconds, goes here. So it's going to be 1,092. So here our TPCQ is 52 picoseconds, which is our contamination delay. That's 1,000. That's 40 picoseconds. Is our setup time, and then 150 
picoseconds, which is our pulse width. Therefore, we're going to choose the maximum of 1,092 picoseconds and 942 picoseconds. Therefore, our clock cycle time must be greater than or equal to 1,092 picoseconds. Get rid of that. So the last thing we're going to talk about during this lecture is the concept of minimum delay constraints. Ideally, sequential elements can be placed back-to-back -back without intervening combinational logic and still function properly. However, that's not the case because we have to deal with hold times, large hold times and small contamination delays. You can accidentally propagate the token through two successive elements on one clock cycle, which doesn't end up working, and it corrupts the system state. And we've defined this before previously in courses as a race condition. We define the race condition as... The behavior of an electronic or software system where the output is dependent on the sequence or timing of other uncontrollable events. In CMOS, you will also hear race conditions described as whole time failures and minimum delay failures. So these two, these three are all synonyms. Note, race conditions can only be fixed by redesigning the logic, not by slowing the clock. And this is because you're still going to have delays that are impacted by the propagation of the clock through the flip-flop or the uh, latch. So here we have some sort of flip-flop. The path begins on the rising edge of the clock trigger. The data may begin to be altered at Q equals 1 after some sort of contamination delay. So here we have our T hold time. We have our contamination delay and then from D to Q, and then we have our contamination delay of the combinational logic. Therefore, we can define the of the flip-flop circuit as simply our minimum contamination delay must be greater than or equal to the hold time minus our TCQ. TCQ. For a latch, the path begins through the data rising through L1, so L1 is latch 1 here, of phi, it must not reach phi 2 until the previous falling edge of phi 2, because it's inverting, right? Because L2 should have safely become opaque, that means it has to go safely through the combinational logic I need here. However, the hold applies twice per cycle versus only once for the flip-flops. So we have this non-overlapping device, so we have to deal with the second, la the second latch. In order to meet this, we have to ensure that these timing constraints are met. So therefore, we're going to calculate this out. We have our lap pulse width. We have our overlapping time. And we have our pulse width, our hold time, our contamination delay, and our CDQ delay. So therefore, for pulse width, our TCD Contamination delay has to be greater than or equal to the hold time minus TCOQ plus the pulse width. And we are going to conclude this lecture with example 5.10. So consider this ALU bypass path example that we've been talking about before. The pulse latch has a pulse width of 150 picoseconds, a setup time of 40 picoseconds, and a hold time of 5 picoseconds, a clock to Q propagation delay of 82 picoseconds, and a contamination delay of 52 picoseconds, and a D to Q propagation delay of 92 picoseconds. So I'm repeating a lot of things from uh, the previous problem, just so that way you have all of the information you need to solve it. If the ALU self-bypass path uses pulse latches in place of flip-flops, will it have any hold time problems? If so, how can they be fixed? So we know our contamination delay is 45 picoseconds of the late bypass mux, so this is given in the problem, and our pulse width is 150 picoseconds, to hold is 5 nanoseconds, therefore TCOQ is 92 picoseconds, minus the setup time, which is 40 picoseconds, which is 52 picoseconds. 
So therefore, we can substitute these in. Our hold time is 5 picoseconds minus TCOQ, which is 52 picoseconds, which you've calculated here, and then 150 picoseconds, which is our setup time, or, I'm sorry, our pulse width time. So therefore, 45 picoseconds is going to be defined as greater than or equal to 103 picoseconds. Because this is obviously not true, the condition is violated, and therefore you have to add a buffer. So the buffer is just going to be 103 minus 45, and that becomes 58 picoseconds. So when we get back from spring break, we're going to talk about time borrowing and how we can address this kind of problem uh, in additional ways.